Welcome, everyone. My name is Steve Hoffman, and I'm the director of Center College's Norton Center for the Arts. And um, I want to welcome and greet all of our Central Kentucky friends, our Norton Center friends, our Center College friends, and our new friends from all over the country. Uh, it looks like we may need to find some new platforms coming because we are starting to continue. This is the second time we've uh, hit more registrants than we have capacity, but we also know that there are other ways that we can, even today, uh, get more people on. For tonight's installment of the monthly Culture Plus series, we've asked some very talented and, and incredible artists in our community about their artistic perspectives or voices, how their voice influences the artwork they create, how life influences their creative process, and how they use their perspective to tell stories. I want to thank our esteemed panelists and moderator for their willingness to participate in this program, so thank you. Immediately following the 60-minute discussion, we will launch our Culture Plus Encore that includes a, a gallery talk in the Norton Center of several key works by Sheldon Tapley. This fascinating deeper dive into Sheldon's creative process is facilitated by Amy Frederick, who is moderating tonight's program. There'll be nothing you need to do except wait a moment as we launch the talk via Zoom. This encore is in addition to the regular program, so stay on for as long as or as little as you like. The entire gallery talk should last no more than 30 minutes. And Center students, the official convocation ends the following the discussion, but please stay on to learn more about this topic, and I guarantee you'll earn karma credits. The Culture Plus series is part of the Norton Center's Creative Conversations program, which is supported by an endowed gift by 1995 Center College graduate, Dr. Jeff Johnson and Ken Michael. Now, I would like to introduce to you Molly Baker, the Norton Center Engagement Services Manager to provide some preliminary details you'll need for this evening's program. Take it away, Molly. Sorry, I needed to unmute there. <laughs> well, I just wanted to, again, say thank you to everyone who's, who's come. We are so glad to see you here um, and to be with us this evening. As Steve said, I just have a couple of logistical things I wanted to mention. Um, first, you'll notice that you're muted, um, but when the question and answer portion of the program comes, which will be near the end, you will be able to ask questions. Um, the way you will do that is to direct those in the chat box to Matt Overing, who you'll see um, on this front gallery page here. So if you field your questions to him, he'll field them to the moderator and we'll do our best to get to everyone's questions. Um, I also wanted to quickly mention that you have two viewing options for those of you not familiar with Zoom. You have the speaker view, which focuses on the person who's actually speaking. And then you have the gallery view, which gives you a page full of um, um, images of people's videos. So all the panelists and speakers tonight will remain on the front page. So with either way, you'll be able to see um, the participants tonight. Um, but related to that, I wanted to take a moment to thank our ASL interpreter, Karen Schulz, um, who, if your, her services will be useful to you, make sure that you spotlight her video so that you'll be able to um, see her screen throughout the program. Um, and finally, just to remind you about tonight's encore, um, to stick around and hope you can join us for that as well. And I'll turn it back to Steve. Thank you. Thanks, Molly. And I want to thank the entire Norton Center staff for making this program happen and for all the hard work our team's providing to get us prepared to have in-person programs again soon. Um, now, it's with great pleasure that I introduce Center College's 21st president, Dr. Milton Moreland, to share a few words. Originally from Idaho, Dr. Moreland earned a degree in history from the University of Memphis and from the Claremont Graduate University of California, he earned master's and PhD degrees supporting his studies in archaeology, ancient history, and religion. Dr. Moreland joined Center College from Rhodes College, where he most recently served as its chief academic officer. Welcome, President Moreland. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Molly. Great to see everybody on this Zoom call. Can't wait to be back in person at the Norton Center really terrific to have some programming going on even during a world pandemic. So thanks to all of the staff 
at the Norton Center for your incredible work. You are keeping our spirits alive. You are helping develop us and give us great culture. And uh, we so appreciate it. I am so happy to have another great program tonight to introduce. And um, this series continues to be fantastic. I'm glad that so many students from center and faculty colleagues and staff from around our campus are able to join in this um, interesting and enlightening program. I, without further ado, would like to introduce the moderator and a great colleague at center. Um, professor Amy Frederick is um, a assistant professor in art history, chair of the art program. She has been at center since 2015. Um, Amy has degrees from Duke, her bachelor's, and MA and PhD from Case Western Reserve University. And she specializes in many things, but particularly 17th century Dutch art and printmaking. So with that, I turn it over to Professor Amy Frederick. Good to see you. Hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you much. Bye bye. Thank you so much, President Moreland. Welcome everybody tonight. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. The first thing I want to do is have our four panelists briefly introduce themselves. So panelists, as I uh, call your name, if you could introduce yourself and tell us just a little bit about what you do. Um, and looking at my screen, I think I'll start with Brandon. Hi, I'm uh, Brandon Long. I'm the visual arts director at the uh, uh, Art Center of the Bluegrass here in Danville, Kentucky. And uh, I'm also a visual artist that specializes in uh, found object art. Great, thank you. Isabella. Hi, I'm an artist working primarily with photography and uh, moving image. Uh, I teach at Center. I teach in the studio art program. I founded the photography and moving image curriculum oh, for three and a half years ago. Great, thank you. Divine. Yes, uh, my name is Divine Karama. I am a hip hop artist by trade. Um, I'm also the director of a youth nonprofit um, out of Lexington called Believing in Forever Inc. Um, and I started my own business last year, King Tucky LLC. And I also teach a hip hop and leadership class in the CLD department at the University of Kentucky. And I'm always trying to find ways to use music and art um, to impact and, and bring people together within the community. Thank you so much. And Sheldon. Hello, I'm Sheldon Tapley. I'm a professor of uh, art and studio art program. I teach drawing and painting. And uh, I've had the pleasure of teaching at Center since 1983, as a matter of fact. So I've worked with a number of students, a lot of students, and uh, many of them I get to keep up with and find out what's going on in their careers. So it's, it's really been uh, a wonderful experience. Great, thank you. I think with this first question, uh, it will be to all. Amy, you just, you lost. You got unmuted. You got muted. That was so strange. Luckily, it did pop up and tell me that. So thank you. Thank you, Isabella. Um, so I think this question is going to be for all four of you. And I think we'll go in the order with which you did your introduction. So we'll start with Brandon. Uh, but the question is that the topic of this panel tonight is on perspective or point of view. And when you think of perspective as an artist, what does that term mean to you? Is it about technique or is it about a lens through which you create? Uh, anytime, anytime you talk about perspective, I think you have to think about um, identity and uh, what the artist, you know, like how the artist uh, navigates the world. And uh, one of the things that I've always uh, tried to make sense of in my art, and especially more recently, is uh, just where I grew up. You know, I grew up in Lancaster, Kentucky, which is uh, 10 miles uh, outside of Danville there. And it's a rural kind of farm community type thing. And I always saw artists making it big in New York and LA and all of these places. So trying to come to grips with what it means to be an artist in Kentucky and find your own, uh, your own, find your own Kentucky, you know, in the art that you present and, uh, 
keep that relevant within the context of where you're from. Great, thank you so much for that. Isabella. Oh, well, it's a great question. And for me, I think being an artist is about the process. And so I'm just gonna share some of my work because I'd rather have you looking at my work than at me. So um, um, this is an example of, um, oh, for some reason my share is not working. Okay, here we go. Um, so for example, this uh, series, I began in 2013 after a um, battery cage facility, an egg facility was abandoned, leaving 50,000 hens uh, to starve in cramped rusted cages. And this is an interior photograph that I took of that facility. And that led me to um, start photographing a lot of different animal farms. Oh, I'm sorry, my, my slideshow is not working for some reason. Here we go. Oh, so that led me to, to start photographing. This is the exterior of that uh, facility. And um, I continued to investigate and research this. I had been an animal rights and, and environmental activist. And this was a way of me learning and really getting a firsthand view of this system. So I continued shooting these landscapes that included um, sites of animal agriculture. And part of my research um, led me to understand the intensive confinement of um, animals in our food system. And so that led me to integrate the number of animals confined in these places as part of the piece above the image. So this is a, a dairy farm on the night of the super moon. Um, this was shot on a day when I photographed this, it was 116 degrees right there. There are, they're far away, but there are dairy calves. It's a feedlot. This is a duck farm. Um, a livestock auction on the night of the blue moon. <laughs> it's not blue on the night of the blue moon. A pig farm. A squab farm. Squab is the culinary term for pigeons. Um, and you can, it's, I know this is a huge photograph and you're only seeing a small representation, but you can see the pigeons flying against the chicken wire in which they're confined. Um, this is a caviar farm. It's a female sturgeon. Um, they're, the eggs are cut out and then they're again impregnated. And this is a family owned turkey farm. So this is an example where um, the artwork is really an artifact of my process. Um, it's just kind of a, almost a byproduct. Um, and I, my art and my activism kind of molded together in this, in this series. Thank you so much. Um, and I know that we're gonna return to, uh, to talking more about that in just a minute. Yeah, thank you so much. Divine, how would you um, think about perspective? Is it, is it a technique or is it a lens through which uh, you create? Um, I, I think it's both, um, especially when you, when you talk about hip hop, um, when you're creating lyrics and creating music. Um, I know for me that, uh, you know, I could take a more technical approach um, to creating, which is focusing less on the impact and the meaning of the words or trying to convey a message and focal just on the technical skill of writing. Um, so sometimes when I write, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm trying to see how many metaphors I can use, the symbolism, um, uh, you know, within the rhyme schemes, the multisyllabics, I'm trying to be a technical MC, um, you know, using the biggest words possible and, and just playing with the different schemes. But then sometimes going into the booth or, or when I open up my pad, um, my method is to convey a message. Mm -hmm. So it may be a little bit more simplistic technically. Um, mm -hmm. However, the impact of the actual words that, I, that I'm, I'm using um, may be what I'm going for that particular instance, that particular song. 
So I think perspective is all about your goal. Um, I know as an artist, sometimes my goal is just to kind of show you, you know, maybe how good I am. Um, but oftentimes, you know, my goal is to convey a message, is to inspire, is to motivate, is to inform. Um, so I think um, perspective is all about whatever your goal is um, when you're creating. So you're thinking about the goal and then how you see that word perspective changes depending on what the goal is. Depending on what the goal is, definitely, because I'm sure all of us can relate. Um, you know, art is, is so multifaceted, every element of art. So a lot of times people would try to pigeonhole us. Um, but as artists, we love the freedom of um, you know, have not the diversity of changing that perspective, changing our goals, because we, we may not want to fit into um, this box this particular day, because our emotions may take us somewhere else. Um, so I think when the goal changes, I think the perspective and the directive changes. Absolutely. Thank you. Sheldon, how would you answer this question? Well, I certainly think of perspective as a tool, uh, and I teach it all the time. So uh, I'm, I'm, you know, deeply involved with explaining it to students and working with them. And, you know, it's a wonderful tool. And it's also a very limited tool. And I, I, I say the first thing about that, that it's wonderful, you know, the whole, the whole history of it, that it, that it brought us a new way of showing the world and uh, understanding how we see the world, uh, you know, basically 500 years ago, when it was invented. And it's also, it coincides with the use of camera lenses because of the single eye, which is at the base of seeing perspective. So when teaching it, it seems like it could be presented as kind of a, a universal model for seeing, but it's really not the way, it's not the only way that we see. It's really just one model for showing the world. And I think that leads to a very interesting conversation when we start thinking about, well, all the ways that we, apprehend the world that aren't covered by perspective. Mm -hmm. Our experience of the world is, you know, only through our, our five senses, really. Uh, and uh, the visual sense, certainly for me, is the most powerful. And uh, it's, it's important to, for, to me to make art and also to teach art in a way that people become highly sensitized to what they're seeing, how they're seeing, uh, how it affects their emotional world and uh, how they can use it then expressively uh, to present something for someone else to see. Great, thank you so much. And Sheldon, I think I'd like to stay uh, with you for just a moment and ask a, a follow-up question to that. Um, how do you determine when you think about this idea of perspective or point of view, how do you determine if your work is a success? Well, it's never easy. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's, no, uh, there's no bell that goes off when uh, a painting is done. So uh, it's often a matter of uh, great indecision and postponement, uh, hemming and hawing and waiting. You know, it's, it's kind of a, a comical, uh, anecdote within my family that I would come home sometimes from the studio and I would say, well, that painting I've been working on for the past month, it's really coming close to being done. And uh, then I'll come in a few days later and I'll say, you know, that painting, it's pretty close to getting done. And then I'm going to finish it tomorrow. And uh, it's never tomorrow. It's all, there's always more to do. And then sometimes I, uh, I find that I'm just stumped, that I don't know how to finish something. And so I set it aside. Occasionally that's a permanent abandonment, but I often return to things. I can share an image with you here. That would be great. Um, this is a pastel called Two Gourds, which is just quite simply the subject of it. And in fact, this uh, was set aside for several months uh, when it was really quite far along. The background was not satisfactory to me. At that point, it wasn't that deep black. I had been uh, working quite hard on it and very frustrated with it. And I had been showing the, the wall that was the inside of my studio, which is a kind of a dull green. It was deep in shade. It was, and it just uh, wasn't ringing true. And I 
it seems like the simplest decision to change the background to what it is now, but decisions always seem easy after one has made one. <laughs> and so the, the, the process of making the, de the decision is often uh, quite, quite agonizing, even though it just seems uh, like the smallest thing. And I think paying attention to the details of how we look and see reveals a whole world. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sheldon. Isabella, I have a, a different question for you. Um, what would you tell your 20 year old self about the direction that your art has taken you? Um, about, did you know you were going to be an artivist when you were 20? Um, and, and could you have foreseen that path for yourself? I think at 20, I could not even imagine being older than 40. <laughs> <laughs> it was completely outside of the realm of my imagination. But um, I think if I could advise my 20 year old self, I would have strongly advised myself and any young artist to find a mentor and find community. Um, what I didn't really understand then was that art is about connection. I've always been an introvert. Um, I never wanted to be seen as needy or dependent. And over the years, I've realized that what's most important about making art for me is connecting with other people who make art connecting with people who love art, connecting with nature, connecting with my soul and our spirituality, if you want to call it. Um, and I think that it took me longer than I would have liked to realize that those things. That's a great answer. Thank you <laughs> so much. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. And Divine, uh, I think honestly, some of what Isabella just said makes me think about some of what you have said about your, your own work also, this idea of communicating um, with an, an audience. And so thinking about communicating with an audience, Divine, what, what goes into your process? What kind of inspires you to perform? Um, how do you prepare to, to engage with your art form? It, it's really evolved over the years. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be 40 in a couple of weeks. And I, I think I wrote my first rhyme when I was like 15 or 16. Um, so when I was younger, um, I churned my art out um, a lot quicker. Um, I didn't wait for inspiration. Um, the craft of the art itself inspired me. So I, I would just start to write and find things to write about. And I was writing and creating at such a high level because I was just so inspired by the art form itself. I think where the evolution for me happened is when I start realizing that my art um, could be a tool or an agent to engage community and truly impact lives. So then um, even going to kind of the technical versus the impactful um, approach to art, as I got older, um, life itself started to inspire me. Um, you know, having children, being a girl dad, um, you start seeing things, um, dealing with pain, dealing with depression, dealing with happiness, dealing with love, um, dealing with the world and everything um, that the world hits you with. I noticed that um, those were the things that kind of informed and inspired my art. So I, I found myself waiting um, to kind of experience life, um, and then that informed my art. Um, and for me, um, when I look back, um, you know, from a technical standpoint, sometimes I look at my 20-year-old self, and I'm like, man, that guy could rap. You know, man, he was nice with it. Um, but he didn't have much direction. Um, technically, he was putting words together really well, but he really wasn't saying anything. Um, so now I think legacy um, and the fact that, um, you know, especially in 2020, when we create, um, our art is going to be here a lot longer than we will. So my kids and my grandkids and great grandkids will have the opportunity to see and hear and experience my art. So 
um, I'm thinking, what am I saying now that can be impactful to them in 30 or 40 years? Um, so I think that's what inspires me the most um, at this point. That's great, Divine. Thank you so much. Brandon, a question for you. Uh, what led you to work in the mediums that you, you work in a variety of mediums? And so what led you to, to choose to work in, in many different uh, mediums with different methods? What is it about um, that technique or that experience that supports you and your creative process? Well, uh, my process for picking the materials that I work with, I want to do a little screen share here. Um, it's kind of uh, a bit twofold, really. It's uh, I, I started whenever I got into this series that I'm currently working on that's uh, made out of recycled roofing tin. Um, I started doing that because I got into photography and I was uh, found myself going out on my grandfather's farm. You know, like he had a tobacco farm and uh, a dairy farm, and it's really a way of life that's kind of disappearing around here. And um, and as I see these uh, structures starting to fall down and the way that they were patched and repaired by a lot of the, the farmers, they weren't really looking to create something artistic. But I would find that the way that they've patched those holes with uh, pieces of uh, found metal that was nearby or maybe with pieces of wood always ended up being really beautiful, um, almost an artwork, like a modern art piece in itself. So I decided to start making uh, that using the actual materials rather than just doing photographs of it. Um, and uh, as you can see on the right side of the screen over here is uh, an example of a tobacco barn here. This is my wife. She's showing that her hair is the color of tobacco there, which I think we can all agree. Nice, nice Auburn color there. But I, I kind of consider myself to be sort of the last of a generation of sharecroppers, you know, uh, and that's sort of what we did. And I kind of think that it's, you know, where we are now as far as where we've come in Kentucky that to suggest that everybody around us uh, raise tobacco seems completely absurd, uh, you know, in 2020. Um, and a lot of these structures are falling down. So what I'm doing is kind of paying uh, an homage to um, these older structures as they're starting to come down. The second reason that I did, uh, that I've started using this as a material and as a medium is because uh, I'm, I'm really super cheap as far as an artist goes. So, so these pieces have about $3.50 worth of materials in them. I make a frame out of wood and I will find the metal on the side of the road or sometimes people will give me a call up and say like, hey, we're tearing down a barn. You want to come grab a piece of it? Um, so each piece has its own, each piece of metal that I use kind of has its own story mm -hmm. as well. And I think it's interesting to, to have the audiences that approach my work, they approach it for two different reasons. We have some people that really like minimalist, um, industrial kind of abstract design, which is kind of where I'm coming from with it. But also you have people on the far absolute opposite spectrum that, uh, remind, it reminds them of their granddad's barn. So it's it's kind of funny to have, you know, things on two polar opposites, uh, finding some aesthetic value in something that you've cr created there. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. sometimes sometimes I get into using uh, found objects for, I think Steve wanted me to share this because <laughs> he saw this in a recycled <laughs> exhibit that we did. I also like to build uh, musical instruments. So this is a good example of that spilling over into that too. This is a, a hubcap from like an old uh, dodge I think it is and a shovel handle off of a shovel that I broke in the yard and uh, there's like let me see I gotta move my little window over here I used like a spatula handle for the bridge of the thing so it's just all kinds of junk thrown together but it's a really fun instrument and uh, Steve invited me to play over at the Norton Center for uh, in the lobby uh, opening for one of the percussion groups that you guys had a few years ago and it was a lot of fun that's awesome. Do you play it very often these days or? No, it just kind of sits in the corner. <laughs> it's a very impractical instrument, this thing. Is. <laughs> Great. So Brandon, I'm going to borrow one thing that you said um, at the beginning when you introduced yourself and actually ask our other three panelists um, to talk about what it means uh, to be an artist in Kentucky, um, just given um, you know, where our college is, where the Norton Center is, um, where our community is. 
And I know Isabella is new to this state, or relatively new. Um, and so um, Divine or Sheldon or Isabella, uh, what does it mean to be an artist in Kentucky right now? Um, I'll, I'll tackle this one. Um, I think for me, um, as a hip hop artist, um, sometimes it's a struggle um, to be um, the type of artist I am in Kentucky only because, um, you know, there's just not a lot of venues um, for the art that I create. Um, there's not a, a ton of support um, for hip hop music. There isn't a, a long lineage and history of hip hop music coming out of Kentucky. There's not a lot of mainstream artists that have been able to blow up and then come back and lay a blueprint. Um, so you really got to love the culture and you really got to love what you do um, to be sustained because sometimes that support, sometimes those doors opening, sometimes that community um, is what sustains you through some of the rougher times. But I also think that is something that has kind of sharpened my skills um, and really um, hunkered me down in my purpose and passion through the years. Um, but then I also want to answer that question from another perspective, because I think being an artist at this specific time in Kentucky um, in 2020 is very important. Um, when you look at the Breonna Taylor situation, um, when you look at the upcoming election, um, which people are saying is probably the most important election of our lifetime, um, as an artist, um, this is a, a great time for us to use our voice um, with everything that is going on in 2020. So I feel a responsibility right now um, I think yesterday Kentucky was trending um, like worldwide on Twitter um, because of the debate with McGrath and McConnell. So the eyes of the world are fixated on Kentucky right now. Um, even though the COVID cases have, have been high um, the last several days, you look at all of the states around us compared to Kentucky. Um, a lot of people's eyes were on Kentucky. Like, what is that governor doing down there that um, has that state doing so much better than the than the surrounding states? Um, the Breonna Taylor situation and the list goes on. So as an artist, I feel this responsibility to speak, not just for the voiceless, but this is a time capsule. Um, I think it's important that we are speaking and creating as artists um, of what is going on at this time. Um, so for me, I feel a great responsibility. I'm a proud Kentuckian. Um, and, I, and I've never been prouder than I am this year as an artist, um, just to be able to speak to some of the things that we are facing as a state um, and as a country. Thank you so much. Uh, is, is this a good opportunity for, for you to perform for us or? <laughs> sure, sure, I, I can do that, I can do that. Um, let's see, should I, should I do something a little controversial or spoon feed them? That is up to you. <laughs> okay, well, hip hop has always been a voice for the voiceless. Um, so in the spirit of that, um, I'll go here. This isn't about politics or how y'all feel. I'm going to give y'all an example of why Colin Kaepernick kneeled. A young boy sold his wit for some bread. Now he catched the bus to work. Last year's lease lapsed. He moved in with his old nurse. She was sick. She had cancer. He was a single father. Helped his daughter with her homework, but never gave her the answers. A follower of Christ. The youth was his life. Last week, he took some boys to go and see Black Panther. Something bigger than pitching grams or shooting hammers, trying to navigate the darkness on the other side of light. It was a cold winter morning. Temperature below freezing. He almost missed the bus because he couldn't find his keys. Scrap it. He just left and caught the bus just in time. He worked a 14 hour shift now, follow my rhyme. He hopped off the bus, breath fighting, the wind blow, his mama sleep, no keys, so we tried climbing in the window. Then a cop drove by, thought he was breaking and entering, but he didn't ask questions, but for them shots, he starts sending them. So again, it's not about politics or how you feel but that's the real reason that Colin Kaepernick knew. Thank you. Thank you, Divine.
Isabella or Sheldon being an artist in Kentucky? Yeah, that's a great question, Amy. I, um, I have such a different perspective than Divine and I really appreciate his perspective. But when I came to Kentucky, I was awestruck by the beauty of the land. I'd only been here a few times. And so um, of course I started photographing and if you don't mind, I can show you a few um, kind of got me started on a, on a new um, sure. series. Um, so of course, can you see that? I can mm -hmm. see. Um, so of course I started photographing, you know, landscapes. Um, I'd been doing landscapes for a long time and it's just so beautiful. Um, and that got me thinking about human connection to the land. And I felt a deep connection to this land, even though my people are not from Kentucky. I have no DNA here. My people are from Mexico on one side, Italy on the other. I'm a first generation American. And yet I felt really connected to the land. And so it got me thinking about, well, what is it that makes us connected to the land? Is it generational or is it something deeper and more universal? And so that led me to start making portraits, um, something that I, I, oh dear, it's not going, here we go. Um, something I'd always wanted to do and I started making portraits. Some of you may recognize a beloved member of the center community, Jamie Powell. Um, and that and this is, I photographed her at a bridge that had figured really big in her childhood and I wanted to make this connection between people and the land and that led me to make, start making diptychs of portraits, of portraits and landscapes. And this is just, this is a boy I met at Clark's Run and we started talking and he agreed to pose for me. And um, so, I may recognize another member of the center community, so now I'm, also experimenting with making diptychs of the portraits and the landscapes and the natural elements. Of course, the pandemic kind of put the kibosh on the <laughs> portraiture, but yeah. But um, yeah. so I've really been thinking a lot about Kentucky, what it meant, what Kentucky means, what it what it means in general um, through this series. I love that. As as a as a Kentucky native, that that is. Um, I love it. Thank you. Sheldon, so you said you've been here since 1983. What yeah. has being an artist been like in Kentucky? Well, now uh, Kentucky is my home. It's, I've lived here longer than anywhere else in my life, uh, but I had never been to Kentucky before moving here. And I moved here from the Midwest. And before that, my family, when I was young, had lived uh, many different places. So I moved around a lot and now I've stayed put and it's home. And uh, actually, it was very moving, Divine, to hear uh, your uh, rap. That poetry was uh, really, really emotionally stirring. So, uh, and you know, like Isabella, I'm also very attracted to the beauty of the state, and uh, that struck me when I first arrived. But the other thing I learned, I think, echoing uh, Isabella and Divine, is uh, the people that I met. And uh, that's really uh, one of the things that kept me here. You know, in, in, uh, in my third year in Kentucky, I, I had a job interview in DC and considered moving away. And on the, uh, the morning that I was driving uh, out of Kentucky to go to that interview, uh, I don't think Kentucky could have looked more beautiful. Uh, so uh, I was really thinking, I'm going to leave this to maybe go live in the extreme outer suburbs of DC and drive on a highway every day. And uh, so that, that ended up uh, with me staying in Kentucky. And, um, you know, I'll show you the, the impact uh, in one painting. This is, this is a, a large pastel that's in that exhibition and it's called Floodplain. So this is a, about five feet across. It's pastel chalk on paper. And uh, it's very much a kind of a synthesis of my uh, appreciation, love of the, uh, the uh, countryside right around this part of Kentucky. 
the rivers, the Ohio River, the Kentucky River. This isn't any one particular place. This uh, is an amalgam of me looking at Kentucky landscape and drawing and painting it for many years. And uh, I put this together uh, as an imaginary work uh, to show this, uh, this valley. And uh, it brings together you know, the experience that's, that I have, that so many of us have, of driving through the landscape, because there's uh, the road in it, um, which cutting through nature. Uh, and yet at the same time, nature is this really indomitable thing with this um, really powerful river carving out the valley. So I came, when I came here, I was primarily a landscapist and I remained one almost uh, entirely just doing landscape for 10 years. Uh, finally, I moved on to doing a number of other things, including still life and portraiture. But uh, the landscape was really my, my first connection uh, to experiencing the state. Thank you so much. We are going to take um, a question from the chat. Um, it's a question for all four of you. And I think we'll start with Brandon. Um, the question is, um, do you think or how would you define art, broadly speaking? That's, that's a great question. Um, and, and my uh, definition of art is, is very loose uh, because I like to say that, that art is uh, better than the emptiness that it replaces. If you can replace emptiness with something better than, than uh, what would be there otherwise, then you've created art. Great. Isabella, how would you answer? <laughs> I don't know that I'm up to the task of defining <laughs> I, yeah, I think it's, um, it's a combination of so many things. I think um, it's a simulation of experience to kind of distill it into something that is deeply meaningful out of sometimes a very chaotic experience. I think it's um, an elevation of, um, of a process into something um, highly crafted sometimes. Um, <laughs> I think it's a spiritual pursuit. <laughs> um, I don't even know if I could, I could probably go on and on, but I think those are some things that kind of have went through my mind as the question came up. Absolutely. It's a hard question. It's yeah. incredibly challenging. Sheldon, how would you answer the question? Well, you know, I agree with so much that's been said. And uh, thinking back on what I've heard, I, I was struck when Divine was talking about being young and just enjoying uh, the technical prowess of being really good at practicing your art. And, you know, since I work with young artists all the time, I can see, you know, pe people starting out in life, they, they have a skill or they want a skill to develop, and they also want to express themselves. And that's the driving force. They just, they, they want to uh, put something out there. And one of the things that happens as they get good at it and start showing it to people or having people hear performances, whatever their art is, uh, they realize, oh, there's an audience. And suddenly it's, it's not just about the artist enjoying making the thing. It's like, oh, I'm making this and someone else is responding to it. Uh, there's a wonderful book that came out uh, in the early 80s when I was uh, you know, early in my career by Lewis Hyde. It's called The Gift. And uh, it's, uh, the subtitle is The Erotic Life of Property. And uh, it's uh, this, all this oxymoron, uh, th th these paradoxes that he puts together, the idea that uh, artworks are part of what he calls a gift economy. So an economy sounds like it's transactional and it's money-based and it's about trade. Uh, but what he meant was the idea of giving a gift and that gift gets passed on. And uh, eventually the, the gift comes back around. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in many ways, uh, making art is a gift for the people who get to enjoy the art. And it seems to me that you know, that's, for me, the, the most sustaining way to think about it. 
and then it comes back to you. Yeah. 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 In, in things like uh, this event where I get to, uh, you know, hear my colleagues and other artists, people in the community talk about why they do what they do, how they do it. Absolutely. Divine, how would you define art? Well, so that's the hardest question I've ever been asked. So thank you. Um, <laughs> no, I, it and, and, I'm, Not mine. <laughs> and I'm thankful um, to have um, my other three panelists answer the question first, um, because they pretty much said everything that needs to be said. Um, I, I'll say this, um, just to keep it simple, because um, uh, a lot of my, my colleagues and other artists um, said some things that I was kind of thinking, but one way I would look at art is it is the communication piece for experience and emotion. Um, you know, and obviously I could go a lot more in depth, but to keep it simple, um, that's what it is um, for me, especially with hip hop. Um, being a little different than other genres of art, there's this responsibility. There's always been kind of a... Um, socially conscious community element to it um, to be a voice for others um, so for me in my art um, it is simply just the communication piece for experience and emotion that's fantastic and what i love about all four of these answers is that i think between the four of you we have this really rich and um and varied idea of what art is and that that to Sheldon's point, that is a gift. So thank you. I have another question from the chat and we will start, why don't we start with Isabella? What is the most difficult part of the artistic process and what do you do when you get stuck? Oof. Um, I think the difficult part for me is um, fear. Sometimes fear gets in the way um, or anxiety about um, why am I doing this? What will it mean to anybody else? What, you know, all those um, kind of doubts about whether I'm, I'm up to the task, whether the task is worthy of pursuing, whether anybody else is gonna be interested, all of those kind of, um, you know, niggling doubts and voices that come up when, you know, in the course of, of trying to pursue um, any project. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I'm stuck, I think for me, I just have to get out there and just start, start photographing, just start with, you know, stop trying to come up with, a big idea and just get out there and start. And that always leads to some kind of process or investigation or idea or something. Sheldon, I see you nodding your head. Are you, are you agreeing? Do you have oh, yeah. a similar answer? Yeah, very much. That, that really makes a lot of sense. You know, I think uh, when I was starting out and I was trying to make paintings that I, that I, liked and I wasn't succeeding and I was full of uh, younger determination, I would just keep hammering away at it, sort of beating my head against the wall metaphorically. And that, you know, that can work, but it's actually not the best way to go about it. And I learned with experience that uh, it's good to uh, keep working, as Isabella said, but in, also to take a break, that is do something different. And so setting aside that pastel that I showed earlier, the two gourds, and just setting it in the corner and just working on something else. And uh, also not being so bothered when things don't work out. I think it's really hard to learn because it seems like a real defeat when I make something that I'm unhappy with. But uh, keep making art. If you make a lot of things, you eventually realize, oh, well, there's gonna be, an, uh, there's gonna be a varying success rate and you can't, um, can't take it so seriously. You just have to keep working. Divine, how would you answer that question? Um, for me, and I know it's, it's been a common thing, but I think it's just the uniqueness of what hip hop was uh, predicated on when it was created. But whenever I get stuck or, or my moments of struggle is 
um, the battle of, of allegiance. Um, sometimes when I go to create, should my allegiance be to the art form itself, which means I'm thinking of what is sonically pleasing to the ear, what kind of hook um, can I capture the audience with, what kind of punchlines and metaphors can I use that'll make people's eyebrows raise, um, what kind of beat am I going to use, what's relevant um, in 2020 that might not be relevant sonically five years ago, um, should I be tied to that or should my allegiance be to simply um, the message of what I'm creating? Um, and I'm always battling back and forth. Um, should my allegiance just be, it's not about the, the sonic impact of the beat. It's not about the witty punchlines and the metaphors. It's simply about a timeless message that may change somebody's life. And then uh, the pressure of, can I do both? Can I do something that draws them in musically, something that gets their head nodding, something that they'll want to listen to with their friends, but then also contain a message that can impact their life. And as an artist, that responsibility, specifically as a hip hop artist, um, in an aging art form, but an art form that is consumed by a younger demographic. So as an aging artist and an art form that's getting older with a demographic that's getting younger, how can I use my experience of the art form, but then also stay relevant to young ears who are consuming um, what I'm creating? Um, so sometimes you just have to, you know, I think what Isabella says, sometimes you just, when you walk into your room as a kid and it's, and it's dirty and, you're, and your parents are telling you to clean it, but you're looking at your room like, where do I start? Sometimes you just start picking stuff up. And eventually, once you start picking stuff up and you get in the throes of whatever it is that you're doing, then you start figuring things out. And that's when the fun starts. Um, so for me, it's definitely that battling allegiance, the art or the message. I love the analogy of the dirty room. That, is, <laughs> that is, it, makes it, it makes it very clear. Thank you. Brandon, how would you answer this question? What do you do when you get stuck? Um, I, I would say that you don't have time to get stuck, really. You just move on to something else. I, I do a bunch of different types of art, and, you know, if I get frustrated or stuck with, uh, you know, creating something visual, I might turn to music for a little while or, you know, do writing for a bit or something. So it's always about just uh, always going, you know, full force creative all the time and not allowing yourself having time to get stuck. But I agree with what Sheldon said, though. You know, you realize that after you've done it, for a while and I, and I haven't been doing it that long you realize that there's going to be some duds in there and I mean you have to look no further than the uh the catalog of, of Picasso I mean he made more art than anybody and he made more great art than anybody but man he made some some pretty rotten pieces along the way too <laughs> so not everything can be great all the time and, and it doesn't matter if it's if it's great all the time either it's about putting it out there great thank you so I think this will be our last question, unfortunately. I feel like I could talk to the four of you for forever. Um, and I'm gonna combine a question from the chat with, with another one that I had. And it's about your voice and uh, helping your students find their voice. So all four of you are educators in some way. And so I guess the first part of the question would be, has your voice changed during this particular moment in time, uh, the year of 2020? And as an educator, how do you go about helping students find their own voice um, or their own perspective or point of view to bring our conversation full circle? Um, you don't have to answer both parts. You can answer one, one or the other, uh, but why don't we start with Sheldon? Well, you know, it, it, it's, it is that wonderful metaphor, the idea of finding one's voice. But the thing that's implicit in it is the solitary speaker, the singular voice. And one of the things that I think is most challenging and most uh, wonderful in teaching 
artists is the experience of getting together to discuss the work. Now, we use a kind of intimidating term, we call it a critique, and I think students find it kind of intimidating. You know, their work is put up in front of the rest of the group and then they start to talk about it and suddenly, you know, one feels like they're on the hot seat. But you can't have a, a voice by yourself. Uh, you know, so, someone's got to hear your voice and you have to respond. And so uh, the way that the art gets shaped in the best way is by having a conversation. And that's a real element of growth that moves someone from being simply uh, wanting a person who just wants to express themselves to being someone who wants to make something that's uh, welcomed by others, that's questioned by others, that's repeatedly examined. Uh, you know, Divine mentioned making work that is timeless, you know, that people might listen to again and again long after the artist is gone. And uh, I think all artists have that kind of hope, right, that, that we're going to make something that uh, could be enjoyed broadly by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can't get there without also uh, engaging with a lot of people. And engaging with fellow artists is a really good way to do it because they'll give you uh, really the most focused feedback. Uh, you get it, you get it quicker and more intensely from people who are also really in, uh, in the arts. They, they're sharp, they know what they're looking for and they'll challenge you. Great, thank you. Divine, how would you answer that question? I'll kind of follow off, um, you know, what Sheldon was saying, because there's, there's a lot of different um, angles on this question. Great question, by the way. Um, I'll focus more on, you know, helping young people find their voice. Um, and I think um, Sheldon is on to something because I think we all need to find our individual voice. Um, but then I think we got to look at it in terms of community um, and what part our voice will play in the, in the larger picture. A metaphor I always use um, with young people is, you know, a football team or any sports team. Um, you know, you don't see a quarterback that, you know, hikes the ball to himself and blocks for himself and throws touchdown passes to himself. Um, you have different players with different skill sets, different jobs on the field. And when all of those great players do the best versions of themselves and they come together, that's when you can win a Super Bowl or win a game. And I often look at the artist community or the community as a whole um, like that. And I think helping young people figure out, are they the quarterback, are they the linebacker, or, you know, what is their specific niche, what is their voice, because I think it'll empower and embolden them in their own life and create a platform for them to express themselves, which, you know, I always credit hip hop for saving my life, so it, it can definitely build themselves, but then also they now have something to add to the bigger design of the world. They can combine their uniqueness with the uniqueness of others. And then that's when you, um, you know, um, start making an impact together collectively. Um, so I think it's just about empowering young people to kind of shatter templates of leadership, of art, mm -hmm. um, not letting everybody tell you that in order to be this, you have to fit into this template because kids are so diverse, they come from different backgrounds, um, you know, different cultural upbringings, just letting them know that you can still be an artist, you can still be a, a game changer in your community using your unique attributes. And I think it's just all about um, emboldening them in that and then teaching them how they can use that, um, you know, to make their entire um, community better by collecting or, or, excuse me, by collaborating with other people. So I think it's just about community. Good question, great question. Thank you. Brandon, how would you answer it? Um, well, I, I work with a lot of uh, beginners with, with what I do at the Art Center of the Bluegrass. And, uh, and I think that one of the most important things that I'm doing to help students find their voice is to just get them in the love of creating themselves uh, or uh, expressing themselves creatively, you know, just getting out there and uh, trying things for the first time. And, and it's amazing how often people are pleasantly surprised by the results of their efforts. You know, and it's just that they really just need to get out there and attempt to, uh, to, do, to do things. And I think that just that uh, experimentation and, and their willingness to get out there is a great thing. Great. And Isabella, I think 
uh, all three of their comments have reminded me about what she said toward the beginning that that art is um, about connection. And so I'm wondering if that is is part of of how you approach finding uh, helping students find their voice. Yeah, I, of course, of course. And that's, uh, that's always the kind of basis. And I mean, I so enjoy connecting with the students and watching them connect with each other and kind of cheer each other on. So I think that's a, an essential part of it. But also for me, and this goes back to what was said previously, it's about encourage, encouraging the practice. Um, it to, this is something that you just do. You just do it, whether you feel like it or not. You just keep the practice up. And I think that's true of so many art forms, music, dance, you know, it's, it requires a, a regular practice and um, kind of goes back to your first question about how my art has been affected by the pandemic. And, you know, I was working on this portrait project and it was like oh well so much for that and um so i just started going back to basics something that i i kind of encourage my students to do which is and i and i don't put it in these words but it, photography is a mindfulness practice mm -hmm. which is just just have no agenda no preconceptions and just be fully immersed in what's around you in the moment and so i've just been making photographs in and around my home. Um, and that has led, you know, I mean, the isolation can be heartbreaking in a time like this. You know, you, you, you have to physically distance yourself from other people to stay safe. But a mindfulness practice can turn that isolation into solitude, which mm -hmm. is liberating. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just sort of been the way I've maintained my practice and what I would um, always advise any any young artist to to keep up no matter what. And we we've kind of talked about that before. Great to to all four of you. Uh, I am so grateful to have spent this hour with you uh, and had this conversation. This was uh, terrific. Thank you so so much. And so Steve, um, back to you. Thanks, Amy. I love how each artist is such a unique and important perspective and that we are fortunate enough to experience works that they each share with us. Our community is so rich in culture and talent. So I, I wanna thank all of you. Um, I also just wanna give a shout out to Divine. Um, if you saw in the news recently, um, his art and activism combined uh, he made a decision to walk across the state of Kentucky and over nine days he walked 309 miles and there were many more people that joined him on the walk uh, in person with him and then just on their own um, and the goal was to get people to vote to register and get people to vote the result uh, Divine mentioned that there were over 30,000 people who registered because of this action. And that's just really incredible. And thank you for, for doing that and including that as part of your, your voice in what you do in the community. Um, before we conclude this portion of the program, I wanna share a little bit about next month. On November 19th at 7.30 Eastern Time, the Norton Center presents a timely and exciting program, Culture Plus Giving Thanks. Free and available to the public, this program will also be a convocation for center students. Culture Plus Giving Thanks examines the upcoming national Thanksgiving holiday, its origins and cultural traditions, while also looking at it from a, a perspective of indigenous people. The program will include indigenous artists with Kentucky ties as they discuss the topic and share their music, poetry, and visual art. The encore part of this program will include very special guest Martha Redbone, who performed on the Norton Center season in 2018. A native of Harlan County, Kentucky, Martha's art incorporates her Native American, African American, and Appalachian roots. So this November program has many partnerships, including the Kentucky Arts Council, the Kentucky Native American Heritage Commission, 
and the Art Center of the Bluegrass. Again, Culture Plus Giving Thanks will be held on Thursday, November 19th at 7.30. If you registered for this program today, more information will be sent to you directly. If not, please visit the NortonCenter.com website to sign up and to receive the latest news and information. I want to again thank our friends tonight for sharing their artistic perspectives and points of view. Art comes in many forms and you each shared with us how unique and special your voice is to our community. And I wanna thank each of you who attended tonight's program for choosing to spend your evening with us. I learned a lot and hope you also found this hour meaningful. If you registered, you will receive a follow-up email with additional resources relating to this exciting topic and the panelists. Once again, the Encore Gallery talk begins in just a moment. Thank you.